I invite you to uh, take your copy of God's Word and let's turn together to uh, 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 4. Uh, you'll find, I'm going to read the whole chapter and that sounds pretty ominous, but it's really a very short chapter. Uh, there's a partial reading of it you'll find on the screen. I encourage you to look it up in your Bible, or you can trust me for the verses that aren't on the screen. <laughs> but uh, if, if you, I invite you to use your Bible, and if you want to use a pew Bible, you'll find the reading on, beginning on page 303. 2 Samuel chapter 4. When Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard that Abner had died at Hebron, his courage failed, and all Israel was dismayed. Now Saul's son had two men who were captains of raiding bands. The name of the one was Benah, and the name of the other Rashab, sons of Rimen, a man of Benjamin from Beoroth. For Beoroth also is counted as part of Benjamin. The Beorothites fled to Githam and have been sojourners there to this day. Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled, and as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. Now the sons of Rimen, the Barathite, Rechab and Benah, set out about the heat of the day, and about the heat of the day they came to the house of Ishbosheth as he was taking his noonday rest. And they came into the in the midst of the house as if to get wheat, and they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rashab and Benah, his brother, escaped. When they came into the house, as he lay on his bed in his bedroom, they struck him and put him to death and beheaded him. They took his head and they went by way of the Arabah all night and brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron. And they said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy. Who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my Lord the King this day on Saul and on his offspring. But David answered Rashab and Benah, his brother, the sons of Rimen of Berathite, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity, when one told me, Behold, Saul is dead, and thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and killed him at Ziklag which was the reward I gave him for his news. How much more, when wicked men have killed a righteous man in his own house, on his bed shall I not now require his blood at your hand and destroy you from the earth? And David commanded his young men, and they killed them, cut off their hands and feet, and hanged them beside the pool of Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the tomb of Abner at Hebron. Let us pray. Lord, we come once again before your word. And as we do so, Father, we, we, we bow humbly before you, seeking your help. Open the eyes of our heart. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we're back in 2 Samuel, and it's been a while since we've been there. It was all the way to last year, remember? That bad joke, got to do the last year joke. So we, we need to look... Uh, back at the previous chapter and you might recall that David had been anointed king over the tribe of Judah while Ishbosheth, Saul's son with the help of Abner had been made the king of the rest of Israel of the northern tribes well Abner was the real power behind the throne of that northern kingdom Abner was a wheeler dealer and his goal was to rule by way of the puppet king, Ishbosheth, because he was pretty much weak willed. But his, his plans fell through when Ishbosheth caught him with one of Saul's concubines. And to catch somebody like that it meant, uh, when somebody did that, it meant that they were laying an outright claim to the throne. So Ishbosheth, for the moment anyway, grew a spine and confronted Abner. Abner decided, well, the gig is up here in the northern kingdom. I'm going to go down here to David in the southern kingdom and see if I can't grab all the power there and promise David the entire throne. But Abner didn't count on David's general, Joab, 
wanting revenge against him because, remember, he killed, uh, uh, killed his brother, Joab's brother, in an earlier battle. And chapter 3 closes with Joab having his revenge on Abner by murdering him. And that brings us, that's the Reader's Digest, readers Di of the Reader's Digest version of what happened there. And that brings us to chapter 4, where we find that when Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard that Abner was dead, his courage failed, and all Israel was dismayed with him. In other words, Ishbosheth and the entire kingdom, everybody up there was just plum scared, right? They were shaking in the proverbial sandals, if you will. And with the murder of Ishbosheth, you know, this is why, or not, uh, with the murder of Abner, Ishbosheth thought he was next. That's why he was afraid. And the other people were afraid because uh, that's the way things happened was, as you put the next king to death, or anybody that had a uh, claim to throne or had supported the previous throne, they were put to death and the family was put to death. And since Abner was the power behind the throne, Abner was gone, Ishbosheth, he had to be next on the hit list. That's what he was thinking. And everyone who supported Saul had to be afraid of what, as well. Because David, remember, he had these 600 men and he kicked booty wherever he went, right? He killed everybody, did everyone in. And what would happen with it, David? and his 600 men, would, his, would they simply ride north and put everybody to death? What are we going to do? Who knows what to do next? Does anybody have a plan? Well, there are two brothers, Benah and Rashab. They have a plan. But before we look at their plan, let's take a little bit, uh, at a, a little bit of a look at these two guys. Who are they? What is their character? Well, verse 2 tells us that they were captains of Ishbosheth's raiding bands. And I take that to mean that they rode around at their own free will and did whatever they want to. They would go to uh, unwalled villages and small towns and take the, the farm goods and the money and the cattle from, from whoever was there. And they, that, you know, that sounds like they're a couple of outstanding individuals, doesn't it? Full of courage. I mean, you know, how much courage does it take from men with military training and I assume they had it because they were captains, how much courage does it take for them to go around and rob farmers and women and children of their goods? The writer of 2 Samuel gives us more information about them in the opening verses. And if you, if you think about it, this is a subtle, there is a subtle sarcasm going on here that the writer is, is putting out there. Not only do these brothers serve a powerless puppet king, the only other heir to the throne is Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. And we're told that he is permanently crippled. He's lame in both of his legs because of some sort of accident that occurred as they were running away uh, when they got the news that Saul and Jonathan were killed at Jezreel. In other words, the house of Saul, they, they weren't in any position to put up a fight, were they? Ishbosheth is pretty much spineless and gutless. And Mephibosheth lacks the physical ability to do anything. So anything that Benah and Rashab do will fall far short of being heroic. It falls, I think, more into the category of a middle school bully trying to beat up on a first grader. I think that's the kind of people they are. So what's their plan? Well, the plan unfolds in verses 5 through 7. Now, some commentators say that verses 5 through 7 give two uh, tellings of the same uh, of the same event, since verse seven appears to be repetition, repetitious, and they do serve or or share three common elements: the brothers coming into the house, Isbosheth being asleep, and the brothers stabbing him to death. But it's normal in Hebrew narrative to take a situation and repeat it, but with added detail that expands upon the previous statement. And if you want another example of this, all you have to do is turn over to chapter 5 and verse 7, and there you'll find the story of how David captures the fortress at Zion, and then in verses 8 and 9 it tells you how he captured the fortress in Zion. But here in chapter 4, verse 7, it's just a little bit different because not only does the writer add detail, the detail about slicing, slicing off Ishbosheth's head, he repeats the item from verse 5 
that he was asleep in his bedroom. It's deliberate. You can almost hear the sarcasm. Rechab and Benah, they're macho guys. They're a couple of tough hombres. They stab a guy to death in his sleep. What is, what's next? They're going to challenge uh, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, to a foot race? You know, that's, that's who they are. They're really, really brave. They came, he slept, they stabbed. Now, what the writer is doing is, is telling us that uh, t- in telling us about these two brothers is he's mocking them as he tells it. Uh, one commentator explained it this way. It would be like a reporter uh, telling about the story of the Nazi blitzkrieg on Poland in 1939. The reporter could talk about how the Germans had an advantage in, in air power, three to one advantage there. He could tell about their tanks and how their tanks cut the Polish cavalry to pieces. But would you be proclaiming German courage? Hardly. How much courage does it take to fire uh, from tanks at men riding on horses? Not a whole lot, does it? I mean, you have ponies against panzers, if you will. In other words, the, the way that you would tell, tell the story, you were, holding, were you holding up ger- German courage for respect? No, you were ridiculing German courage is what you were doing. So you see the sarcastic innuendo in the writer of the writer. Uh, They may appear, these brothers may appear to be bold, they may appear to be daring, but let's read between the lines. Let's take a closer work, a closer look. They're not strong, they're weak. They're not courageous, they're cowardly. They're not manly, they're, if you will, mousely. If you, you know, that's how they are. After these two brave and courageous brothers murder Ishbosheth in his sleep, they take off his head, they put it in a basket, they, and they head south. Uh, they jump on their camels, if you will, put them on cruise control, and they drive all night, and they arrive in Hebron to uh, fulfill the final stage of their plan. The head of Ishbosheth will be their proof of loyalty to David. Surely they will be rewarded by David for their loyalty, for their courage. Surely they'll be rewarded. So after they ride all night, they get to David and they announce to David, here's the head of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, your enemy who tried to take your life. This day the Lord has avenged my Lord, the king, against Saul his, and his offspring. That's verse 8. You know, we can assume that David already knew whose head was in the basket without being told who it was because he lived in the palace, didn't he? He lived with those guys. He lived with Ishbosheth, but it's one thing uh, for, for him to know whose head was in the basket in front of him. It's quite something altogether, uh, quite another matter to interpret what was being said to him by these two characters. Was this really God's vengeance upon Saul's house? Were these two brothers the servants of the Lord that they claimed to be? Or were they just bloodthirsty killers attempting to grab power in the new kingdom. You and I know this because we've, we've read ahead, but David hasn't read 2 Samuel 4 yet. He's having to live it. So how's he going to decide who these two brothers are and what these two brothers are? How will he, will he determine if they are the means of God's path to the throne of Israel or if they are power-hungry killers? In reality, they're both. God uses these evil men to pave the way to David's sitting upon the throne. But that's another sermon. It's another direction. We're going to be talking about something else, a little different here. But the whole matter that's before David highlights something I think that we all need desperately, and that's discernment. The ability to see what's beneath the veneer to what's really going on. How can we determine what is true and what is false when it comes to our faith? How do we do that? How do we know if what we hear on the radio or see on the television from the person preaching and the person teaching, how do we know whether it's true or not? In this case, it's difficult for David to figure things out because these guys put a theological spin on things, and that's what the preacher on the radio does. They put a theological spin on their story. 
Today, God has used us to deliver you from your enemies, David. We're nothing more than the Lord's obedient servants when we did, when we killed Ithbosheth for you. We were just being obedient to God. These guys were the spin masters of their day. They took what was obviously first degree murder and they made it sound like that they were doing David and the Lord a favor. And they did this by way of cloaking their argument in theology. They tell their story as if it lined up directly with the will of God and the word of God. It's like the story of the little boy who was told by his parents, do not go near the pond on the property. You are to stay away from it. Never go down there. But one day he ventured close to the water's edge and he received a thorough baptism, if you will. And when he saw his father, he had his explanation ready. He said, Father, I stood beside the pond and I said, Get thee behind me, Satan. And he pushed me in. <laughs> or there's the guy I remember from college who was giving his testimony. And he started about talking about how he drove in his hometown. And I remember thinking, well, I guess everybody's testimony has to do with how they drive around where they grew up. But anyway... But anyway, that's, that's a different matter. But anyway, there was a four-way stop. There was an intersection with a four-way stop, and the law required him to stop, and common sense required him to stop. But you know what? He never stopped. And he, but in all of his non-stopping days, God never allowed him to have a wreck. It is indeed wonderful to have God, isn't it? That's what I thought. I mean, both dripping wet boys and ignorant college students find theology useful, don't they? What I'm saying is this, is what we believe about God, and that's all theology is, is our study of God and what we believe about God, can be used to explain away almost anything and everything that we do. We can blame our mistakes on the devil and claim that our questionable behavior, questionable behavior is somehow sanctioned by the Lord because, hey, we got away with it. More than once. It's easier to say, I think the devil made me do it, than it is to take responsibility for our sin, isn't it? It's easier to give ourselves permission to do something under the guise of God's grace and God's forgiveness than it is to get on our knees and pray for the strength or pray for God to give us the strength to be obedient to his word. Rechab and Benah come before David with blood on their hands and theology on their lips. And they hope that the latter will cleanse the former. Murder always sounds more pleasant when it's wrapped in religion. Her sinful behavior always sounds better if you just put the right spin on it. And here's the spin the two brothers put. Verse 8, The Lord has avenged me, has avenged my Lord the King, this day on Saul and his offspring. Committing first degree murder is okay because we did it in the name of the Lord and we did it for the Lord's anointed king. Be careful that you're not using God for your own personal convenience. That you're not using him to explain your sinful behavior. That you're manipulating God to keep, him, to keep yourself from submitting to his law, to his grace. So what should our belief about God do for us? What should our theology do? Our theology should lead to doxology. What we believe about God should drive us to our knees in praise of God. Jesus Christ, knowing the Bible, knowing God through the Bible, and through his Son, Christ, always brings about transformation and exaltation of Christ. So David... So how does he see through the theological spin of these two brothers? What is it that helps him discern whether God is in the situation or whether, or whether God is his redeemer or whether God is using Rashab and Benah as his redeemer? He's able to discern and recognize these brothers for what they are because he remembers, verse 9, he remembers who his true and only redeemer is. As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. 
The Lord who lives is his redeemer. You aren't my redeemer. You two brothers aren't re my redeemer. God is my redeemer. And he knows that because, in two ways. First, David knows God is his only redeemer. Why? Because he knows his Bible. Guess what? He knows the Ten Commandments. And he knows that the Ten, Ten Commandments say, you shall not commit murder. He knows that God's will cannot be accomplished apart from obedience to God's word. You can put whatever spin you want on your behavior. I can put whatever spin I want on my behavior. But when our behavior contradicts the revealed will of God, guess who's wrong? We are. We are the ones violating the, God, the commands of God, and God calls that sin. David's knowledge of the Bible was more than just chapter and verse. You ever known somebody that knows chapter and verse of the Bible and can quote it to you, but you look at their life and that's all they can do is quote it chapter and verse? It doesn't mean anything. David's knowledge, though, was, it was a knowledge that resulted in a change of his heart a change of his thinking, which was a, involved a change of his life. It transformed him. How about you? Does what you know about God change how you live? Does it transform how you live? When you discover that God's word says something and you're doing something that's against God's word, do you make excuses or do you make confession? Which one do you do? Second, I think there's a note of gratitude. A note of gratitude in David's words. As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. Think about that. The Lord, he, the Lord has redeemed him out of every adversity. He might have been thinking about the, time that, the times that Saul's spear whizzed by his head. Thank you for that mercy. Or about the time that, that the Lord used Saul's own daughter to, de to help deliver him from Saul's clutches or about the time that the priest gave him the holy bread and Goliath's sword. Maybe that's what caused him to write the 103rd Psalm which we used in our call to worship this morning. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Forget not all of his benefits who redeems my life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and with mercy who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Maybe that's what he was where that came from. So David's thankfulness for the way that God had redeemed and delivered him in the past helped him to discern God's redemption and deliverance in the presence. In the present, David's gratitude toward God helped him remain steadfast in his faith. That's a principle that we all need to have in our hearts and in our lives, isn't it? Remember that giving thanks to God helps us remain faithful to God. Giving thanks to God helps us remain faithful to God. Remembering how he has redeemed and delivered us in the past helps us hold fast to him in the present. And this is played out in the life of a man named Polycarp, one of the early church found fathers from 155 A.D., Polycarp, Carp of Smyrna. He was hauled before the authorities, before the Roman proconsul, and was again asked to say that Caesar was Lord, to take the pinch of incense and burn it there and proclaim Caesar as Lord. Polycarp refused. The proconsul assured him, I've got some wild beasts in cages back here, and I'll throw you in there with them unless you change your mind. He refused again. He said, Send for them. And then the proconsul said, if you despise the wild beasts, I will send you to the fire. Swear, and I will release you. Curse the Christ. And this brought up within Polycarp one of the most stirring responses in all of church history. He says, 80 and 6 years have I served Christ, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? The words are different than David's words. It's the same principle, though, isn't it? Thankfulness keeps us near to God. Now the passage, the chapter closes, it ends with a note of justice. And this note of justice, I believe, is a note of encouragement for the people of God. After Rashab and Benah 
give their spin doctor version of the truth uh, to David. They anxiously await what they believe will be good news. We've done this good thing. And I can imagine them standing there, and when they heard the words of David, they broke out in a cold sweat. Because David says in verse 10, When one told me, Behold, Saul is dead, and thought that he was bringing good news, I seized him and killed him at Ziklag, which was the reward I gave him for his news. Oh, God! <laughs> and they had to get sick to their stomach when David said what he did in verse 11. How much more when wicked men have killed a righteous man, on his man in his own house on his own bed. Now, how could David have known that last detail? The only way he could have known that is if, they, if, if those two brothers told it to him. They had to gleefully tell him every detail of their plan and what they had done. They must have thought, you know, that we're, we're just slick. We're just pretty slick. Well, David saw the whole thing for what it was. Sinful men twisting the word of God to their own sinful advantage. David orders their execution. These men will never sneak and they will never stab again. The fact that David, as God's chosen king, deals justly with these two brothers brings us hope. It brings encouragement. And the obvious question is, well, how do, does somebody's execution bring hope? Well, let's remember something. We're in the Old Testament and David is and his kingdom is a foreshadowing of the kingdom that will come. The kingdom that will come. The fact that God's earthly, and the fact that God's earthly king deals with sin and deals with injustice is a sure sign that one day when King Jesus returns, he will do the same. One day, everybody who sneaks, everybody who stabs, everybody who lies and cheats and steals or whatever, they will receive what they deserve. That's what our series of studies uh, during Advent pointed to from Isaiah 9, chapter, uh, verse 6. Listen to the words that, that we have there. Listen to the sure hope that, will one day be, that they will be completely fulfilled. For unto us a child was born. For unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of his kingdom, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to hold it with. With what? What will it be upheld with? With justice, Isaiah writes. And with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Beloved, one day God's kingdom will be established in all of its fullness. One day the one who delivers from all adversity, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he will come and we will, we will be permanently and eternally delivered from our sin. And we can read about it. You can read about it if you just turn to the Revelation of John in the 21st chapter beginning in the third verse. You can read about it there. And one day God, it says there, one day God will wipe every tear from our eyes and death will be no more, neither shall there be any mourning or crying or pain anymore because the former things have passed away. On that day, the day that Jesus sits upon his throne, John goes on and he writes, he says that Jesus will say, Behold, I am making all things new. I am the Alpha, I am the Omega. I am the beginning, I am the end. I am the first and I am the last. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. To the one who conquers, the one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God and they will be my people. These verses, those are some of the most comforting verses in all the Bible, I think. I've, I've used them more than, at more than one funeral because of the truth and the comfort that they bring. But they bring truth and they bring comfort in the here and now for the promise that they give, don't they? And there is no comfort without justice, is there? If the evil get away with what they do, how is that comforting? There's no comfort without justice. Indeed, 
Comfort and justice are inseparable. And the witness to this truth and the confirmation of this truth is found in the 8th verse of Revelation 21. After all of this promise of no more dying, no more death, death being put to death, it says this, but as for the cowardly, the faithful, faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Praise the Lord. There is a day that is coming when the kingdom of God will be established. And on that day, the Lord's justice will, be, will prevail. The only way to escape the Lord's justice, the only way to escape the Lord's wrath, is by way of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Do you know Christ? Do you know the one that transformed David's life? Or do you just know chapter and verse? Do you know your Bible? And I think it's great that you know your Bible and you have to know your Bible and you ought to know your Bible. But you know what knowing your Bible needs to do? Make you know your God. It's not any good to just know and memorize the printed page unless you know the God of the Scripture. This is the revealed will of God. Revealed will of God. He reveals himself in his word. Do you know that God? Through his Son, Jesus Christ. Have you been transformed? Have you been changed? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your word. I just pray that we would all be transformed through the power of your Holy Spirit and through the power of your word. Lord, we thank you that one day you will return, that your righteousness and your justice will prevail. Lord, help us to live for you in the strength of your word and the strength of your Holy Spirit in each life and in each heart. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.